السلام عليكم انا كاي هاتسو واهلا وسهلا بكم الى حلقه جديده ومثيره من كولتشر بيتس هوبا ان ذا كلاش اوف ايجز هاز تو بي ون اوف ذا موست اندر ريتد اند اندر ابريشيتد بوكيمون موفيز ان ماي اوبينيون فور سم ريزن ات سيمز تو جيت جلوست اوفر ا لوت اند ايم نوت ريلي ذات شور واي اتس جوت اكشن بريتي ماتش اول اوف ذا ليجندريز فايتينج ايتش اذر اند اي سورت اوف لايك ذا ستوري تو Though I have to admit that the real reason I like this film so much is because it is set in Dahara City, which many of you will know is based on Dubai. And if you've been around on this channel long enough for me to constantly beat you over the head with this information, I used to live in Dubai. In fact, I was born and spent most of my life in the United Arab Emirates, where Dubai is. And being very familiar with the country's culture, religion, and language, I thought that analyzing this movie would be the perfect way for me to tell you more about my home turf and just how much of it made it into this movie. So before we start looking at the movie itself, here's a quick history and rundown of the UAE. The area which is now a part of the United Arab Emirates. Al Emirat Al Arabiya Al Mutahhida in Arabic spent most of its time as nomadic Bedouin tribes with varying influence from Persia, Oman and of course the Ottoman Empire. The primary industries were really just fishing and other food producing activities up until about the 16th century when pearl diving really took off and the biggest industry of all got even bigger. Trade Even before our time this area was home to numerous trading ports and all that trade brought people from all over during their travels to stop and sell gold silver desert diamonds pearls spices you name it and it was traded it was the gulf's best pearl diving spot and one of the best places to trade goods from china india portugal and beyond came through here even earlier despite there not being that much in the way of mass civilization in this part of the world Roman coins and goods found their way here to trade as well as they've been dug up in archaeology expeditions. The Arab people of the Gulf, the Khaligis, have always been involved with trade and exchange. Ibn Battuta, famous explorer from Morocco, stopped here and in Muscat, and a local explorer, Ahmad Ibn Majid, the Lion of the Sea, wrote several books on marine science and the movements of ships, which helped people of the Arabian Gulf to reach the coasts of India, East Africa, and other destinations. And this in turn led to him supposedly assisting Portuguese navigator Vasco da Gama find his way from Africa to India. Later on, the British turned up, and in exchange for the at the time so-called pirate coast stopping the piracy, the British protected the sheikhdoms which formed a British protectorate known as the Trucial States. or sometimes called the Trucial States of Oman. But the British couldn't afford to keep protecting the area forever, and despite the offers from the Trucial States to pay all the costs for the Royal Navy to protect them, the British gave them their independence. After much deliberation, six of the nine interested parties joined to form the United Arab Emirates, with Qatar and Bahrain choosing to go their own way, and Emirate Ras Al Khaimah joining a year later in 1972, with the principal driving force behind the formation of the UAE being Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan Al Nayyan, the founding father of the UAE and its first president, or Rais. In total, there are seven emirates: Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Al Sharqa, Ajman, Um Al Qawain, Fujaira, wa Ras Al Khaimah, or in English, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Sharjah, Ajman, Um Al Qawain, Fujaira, and Ras Al Khaimah. These are the emirates which make up the current state of the United Arab Emirates, a place rich in oil and natural gas reserves and a hub for tourism as well as international trade. Abu Dhabi is the capital city, by the way, not Dubai, which is a common misconception. Each emirate has its own monarch, as the country is one of the world's only federal monarchies, wherein each emirate has its own sheikh, and they all elect a prime minister and a president. Positions each filled by a sheikh. For hundreds of years, and now even more than ever, the UAE is a place where the world comes together, or collides, if you will. A global village of sorts, which I think is quite fitting, seeing as in the Hoopa movie, legendary Pokémon from all over the Pokémon world come together to duke it out. One of the attractions in Dubai is actually called the Global Village, where countries set up pavilions and sell products, food, and other items from their nation. I've been to it quite a few times, and it was always interesting to see what national landmark replicas were built and shown off, and what was on offer in each pavilion. At an early age, it was one of the things that started my interest in other cultures and places. And in general, the multicultural, worldwide aspect of the UAE is what set me down this path. And coincidentally, I grew up right next to a place called Cultural Square. Anyways, let's go through the movie and see how much is true to real life and what inspired things in the film. I think you'll be pretty surprised. First things first, though, before we take a dive into the movie setting, let's have a little look at Hoopa itself and where the inspiration for its design originates. And for this, I have brought along a guy who has made many, many videos digging deep into the design origins of Pokemon. 
Loxton, take it away. Hoopa! Hoopa's design is mainly derived from jinn, a type of mythological being which, while known today as a creature from Islamic theology, actually originated in pre-Islamic Arabia. Nowadays, we know them from their depictions in pop culture where they're more widely known as genies. This name comes from the word jinni, which is the singular form of jinn. So Hoopa is actually based on a jinni. And perhaps the most well-known story involving Ginny today is that of Aladdin and the Lamp, which is where most of our modern preconceptions about Ginny come from. Some of the greatest magicians in Arabic lore were able to capture Ginny to do their service, and tied them to items such as lamps and rings. These Ginny weren't usually obligated to give wishes to whoever helped them, but if they did, it would be out of gratitude, or as an incentive to open the bottle. Now, if they were bound to their prison, jinn were slaves to their owners, but did not have actual reality-warping powers. The wish was more like a command, hence the term, your wish is my command, that they often say, All right, your wish is my command. And the jinn simply used their incredible powers to do their master's bidding. If their master wished for a castle, they would build one. If their master wanted money and riches, then they would have to pull it out of their own stash. Nevertheless, a genie is still allowed to refuse orders if his master asked for something beyond his abilities. While much of this has been lost in modern depictions of genies, Hoopa, as a genie, is pretty faithful to the idea that genie fulfilled wishes with extraordinary powers, but couldn't just snap their fingers and make something happen. Hoopa uses its rings like this, and also in its unbound form can be seen helping rebuild using its many arms at the end of the Hoopa movie. Hoopa also asks Ash if he wants to wish for anything, like to be a Pokemon master, though he refuses, interestingly. Deep Ash Lore Genies also have some sort of contractual clause, stating that they have to give you exactly what you ask for, but maybe not in the way you were thinking of when you made the wish. Ask for a ton of money, and it will appear. A literal ton of money. Better hope that's all high denomination bills and not pennies. Then, while Hoopa seems to do its best when fulfilling wishes, it often mishears or misunderstands what people are asking for, thus making frequent mistakes. For example, in the movie, Ash and friends ask Hoopa for some water as they were thirsty. In response, Hoopa drenches them with a whole swimming pool's worth of water, not realizing that they only wanted a glass of water. So all in all, Hoopa embodies a typical genie both in design and demeanor, though with some more traditional aspects along with all of the modern ones, and thus manages to deviate from some of the more well-known stereotypical tropes. Thanks for clearing that up, Loxton. Anytime, Kai. There's still a lot more when it comes to Hoopa's design though, so go check out his video afterwards where he breaks down every aspect and influence of Hoopa's design. And I also happen to make a little appearance too. Anyways, on with the film and Dahara City. Oh, by the way, the name Dahara is a mix of Dubai and Sahara. You might think that this comes from the Sahara Desert, but the word Sahara in Arabic just means desert, so really you should just say the Sahara instead of the Sahara Desert because you would be saying the desert desert. Right as the film starts, we come across some traditional architecture as well as these traditional boats called dows, known in Arabic as dawa. These boats were and are still used for fishing and pearling, two historically important industries in the area as well as for coastal trade. Dows aren't exclusive to the Gulf, and there's many different types of them. In the UAE, the main ones are the Sunbuk, a reasonably sized and iconically shaped fishing dow, the Shu'ai, a larger dow, and the Jalibut, the modern successor to the Shu'ai. But there are so many more types which are used in Kuwait, Oman, and the rest of the Gulf, like the Boom and the Ranja. Moving on, we get a couple more glimpses of these traditional houses. These houses at the beginning belong to a group of houses called Arish. Arish, also known as Barasti, are a style of house that were built by the Bedouins, a nomadic desert people, in the summer. During the winter, they stayed in tents called al shar made from camel or goat hair, but in the summer months, these types of dwellings were way too hot to stay in. Arish are very, very airy in the summer, allowing for ventilation and come in a couple of different shapes and sizes, usually either square or rectangular with flat roofs or triangular tent-like structures. They are mainly constructed using palm fronds, an abundant local resource which are extremely versatile and have also been used extensively in the fishing, pearling and trading settlements on the coast. Arish are built by first constructing wooden frames from mangrove poles, split palm trunks or pretty much any other wood that you could find. The palm fronds are then used in two different ways, as straight poles with the leaves stripped off for creating screens, allowing airflow, and with the leaves still on as thatch. 
In coastal settlements, the palm fronds are removed in some places for ventilation, while in the interior, in the middle of the desert or in oasis areas, fronds are placed in such a way as to block out hot air. And actually, many of these Arish houses were built along the Dubai Creek pre-1900s, which would probably look not too different from the shot in the Hooper movie. It was actually estimated that up until the 1970s, about 80% of the UAE's population lived in these Arish houses. In the Hooper movie, we can clearly see the coastal Arish back when Dahara city was just starting out, with the typical window openings to let in the breeze. Now, in this flashback to when Hooper appeared and started stealing the villagers' food, one other small detail is that he is stealing lokma, which they are frying. Lokma, also known as lokaimat in the Gulf, are essentially bowls of deep-fried dough which are then smothered in either honey or syrup, and then topped with something else like cinnamon. They're very sweet, and to be honest, I can't say I like them very much, but it's been a long time since I've had any and reading about them for this video has made me want some again. What I like about the inclusion of Lukma here is that it's a pretty minor detail, but it shows that the people working on the movie did their research. Nice touch. One other thing that we can see in this scene is the inclusion of wind towers on top of Arish. Wind towers, known as Barjil in Arabic, are a common architectural staple in the Gulf, especially so in the UAE. It's believed that they originally came from Iran or Persia, which makes sense because there's a lot of Persian influences in architecture and other places in the Gulf. Iranian wind towers known as Badgir in Farsi tend to be a bit more colourful than their Khaliji counterparts, but they work in the same way. The insides of these towers are hollow, as they act as a ventilation system, allowing hot air to rise out the top of it, and cooler directed winds to flow down into the home through the openings. They're actually really, really good at it, and recently there's been some efforts in the UAE to look into whether they can be reintroduced into homes to cut down on air conditioning units in order to conserve power and reduce the country's carbon footprint. Most barjil are of a square shape, but this one in Sharjah, the emirate where I'm originally from you could say, is round and cylindrical instead of oblong. At the beginning of the Hooper film, we see barjil made from cloth sticking out the top of the Arish. These usually had openings on all sides as to push as much cool air as possible into the home. These ones are the most basic kind of wind tower, but later on we see barjil in their more recognisable masonry form with wooden rods in more typical traditional Emirati buildings. In the film we also see some more later which aren't functional and appear to be just for show, which is also done nowadays when people want to use them for the style rather than for the function. Though here, as Hooper snaps one off the top of a building to use as a weapon, you can see the hollow interior. These buildings in the city are locally known as Bait Murjan, coral houses, which are constructed using sea stone and coral. In the case of the ones in Dubai, the materials are taken from the Dubai Creek. The coral and sea stone are stacked in a bricking fashion, set with a mixture of mud, sand, gypsum and on occasion limestone. Later, the building is covered with a layer of sand, mud and rock for added insulation and protection. The oldest of these types of homes date back to the late 1800s, and historians attribute the abrupt change in building materials to a fire that swept through the Deera side of Dubai Creek in 1894, virtually destroying almost all of the market and surrounding Arish homes. Residents then looked to a more fire-resistant material in the construction of their homes, and sea stone and coral were readily available. At the turn of the 20th century, these buildings were considered to be the best type of home available, and in the early 1900s, only a few landmarks were built out of sea stone and coral using wind tower technology. In the past, these types of buildings signified wealth and status. The later, more elaborate homes were built with a central courtyard or majlis commonly seen in Islamic architecture, and the wind towers would be situated on one or more exterior rooms. And gradually, this type of construction became more common as merchants, traders and local families settled along the Dubai Creek and their living conditions gradually improved. The homes along the eastern shore of Dubai's creek, in Bur Dubai, are separated into two sections. The Al-Fahidi Historic District, formerly known as al Bastakia, and al Shindara, where the ruling family of Dubai, the al Maktoums, resided. In the 1980s, a restoration project began to preserve these original homes along the Dubai Creek. The area now known as Al-Fahidi Historic District Al is the centre of the restoration effort and the neighbourhood, open to the public, contains more than 55 homes. The town is still commonly known as Al Bastakia, which got its name as it was primarily built by immigrants from the city of Bastak, Iran, who left their native homeland due to ongoing religious persecution, as well as tax breaks and other incentives offered by the Emirati government. 
Also, random fact about me here, when I visited Albastakia on a school trip, a Google Street View van passed by us outside and I ended up on Street View, and more than six years later you can still see me outside the Bastakia if you go into Street View by it. One other interesting thing to note in this scene here is another piece of architecture that Hooper uses as a weapon. This tower that Hooper throws is a minaret, which you find on mosques, which means that Hooper attacked and vandalized a place of worship. The implications of this also means that Islam is now canon to the Pokemon universe. Or whatever the Pokemon world's version of Islam is. Minarets are used for the call to prayer, the Adhan, which is done five times a day at dawn, noon, mid-afternoon, sunset and night. Originally the call to prayer was shouted from the top by someone so everyone could hear it, but nowadays it's usually done from somewhere else in the mosque with a microphone and loudspeakers fitted into the minaret to make it easier to hear. Anyways, moving on, before the group get transported to Dahara City, they're staying at this Pokemon Center, which seems to be in the middle of the desert. This oasis reminds me of a place called Liwa, a chain of oases on the border of some gigantic sand dunes which form the northern edge of the Rub al Khali, or Empty Quarter. It's pretty close to the Saudi Arabian border, but because it's uninhabitable remote desert there's no demarcation, which is a change because despite the fact that the UAE and the countries it borders are all in the GCC with freedom of movement for its citizens, there's a lot of barbed wire fencing and most of the border is demarcated, patrolled and very, very secure. There are a few hotels in the Liwa Oasis too, so that also matches up with the movie. Going a little further on after the group has an encounter with Hooper's Unbound form, they get on a boat. Now this seems like a pretty minor detail, but again it's just the small details that are so accurate that I love. Here they are seen crossing from an old part of Dahara city to the new town. This transit is the exact same in Dubai. If you want to cross the creek without taking a bridge, you would get on a small boat called an Abra, pay the fee of one dirham to the ferry driver, and cross to the other side. There are two routes, one that takes about five minutes and the other seven. Though if you wanted, you could charter your own to ride around the creek for a bit by yourself. This is a really common way to cross the creek. It's super cheap and runs all hours of the day as well, which makes it very convenient if you want to cross over. This area around the mouth of the creek is regarded as the Old Town. It's where the remaining traditional buildings are, and the golden spice hooks are still there, which you can visit and shop in. Though I'd say that crossing from the Deira side to the Bird Dubai side is a bit like crossing from the old to the new. Though Bird Dubai also has a historic area with the Bastakia, the most well-known old markets or souks are on the Deira side. Plus, all of the modern buildings that you think of when you picture Dubai are on the Bird Dubai side. Bar Dubai, by the way, means mainland Dubai, which is a reference to the historical separation by the creek of Bar Dubai and Dira. Speaking of the creek, let's talk a little about the layout of Dahara City in comparison to Dubai. Dahara City appears to be Dubai, but flipped around. They've taken the old town and made it completely separate on what would be the Dira side, but because it's mirrored around, in reality it would be on the Business Bay side. We do get a look at the business bay side of the creek later in the movie though, when a bunch of legendary Pokemon are chasing Ash around a similar looking area in Dahara City. The creek originally didn't extend all the way around, nor was it that deep, though some sources say that at one point it was said to go as far inland as Al Ain a long long time ago. But after numerous extensions and dredgings, the new deepened creek now stretches all the way around Dubai and into the Arabian Gulf. Also, very minor detail here, but in this shot you can see a Dubai Metro terminal building in the background. Not much to say about the Metro, but when it was first opened in Dubai everyone just went on it because it was new and fancy and people didn't really use it for much else. Now that they've extended the lines though, it's pretty useful for getting around the city. Further up the Saltwater Creek is a place called Ras Al Khor, meaning top of the creek. It's a mangrove wetland reserve in the middle of urban Dubai, which is home to many different animals, especially birds. I remember when we drove past it you could often see flamingos inside. While we don't see the specific area in the movie, there is some greenery present early on in the film in and around Dahara City, so it's not entirely plucked out of thin air. Okay, before moving on, the backstory told during the group's Abra crossing about how Hooper came to Dahara City and how the city developed shares a a couple similarities with the history of Dubai itself, namely how the city quickly prospered and gained more wealth after the discovery of oil. You could almost say that Hoopa appearing to the people of Dahra is similar to how the British turned up on the shores of the Gulf and eventually discovered oil, which is what set the UAE on its current trajectory of success. 
You could say that with the world's colliding theme, that Hoopa battling other legendary Pokemon is symbolic of the British Empire's battles with other colonial powers in the Middle East. After all, in the film Dahra is said to be in Kalos, which is based on France, a country which had a heavy presence in the region at one point. But this of course is Pokemon we're talking about, so this obviously wouldn't be the case. Interesting parallels though. Now, let's talk a little more about the buildings of Dahra. A lot of them are pulled directly from the skyline of Dubai. We've already touched on the metro stations, but there's also the Marriott Harbour Hotel building, and this pointy pyramid top building which is also from Dubai, but I couldn't find out what the name of it is. And of course we have this building which sticks out of the Dahra skyline and is none other than the Burj Khalifa. The tallest building in the world, standing tall at an impressive 828 meters. Its name translates as Khalifa Tower. Construction started in 2004 and finished in 2009, with it being opened a year later in 2010. Originally it was called the Burj Dubai, but after the 2008 financial crisis the Emirate of Dubai was left pretty much bankrupt and was bailed out by the Emirate of Abu Dhabi. So as a token of gratitude, the building was renamed after the ruler of Abu Dhabi and the UAE, Sheikh Khalifa bin Zayed Al Nayan. The building itself was inspired by Islamic architecture, notably the spiral minaret of the Great Mosque of Samarra in Iraq. It is situated next to the Dubai Mall, once the largest shopping mall in the world. Now the second. If you book in advance, you can go up the Burj Khalifa to the 124th floor onto the viewing platform. I've been up a few times, once when it was opened and then after that a couple times when friends visited as they always wanted to go up and it's one of the touristy things to do, but the lift is one of the fastest in the world I think and the view from the platform is amazing. No joke, I could see my house from up there on a clear day. The Burj Khalifa isn't the only Burj in Dubai. There's also the Burj Al Arab, the Tower of the Arabs, which calls itself the world's only seven-star hotel. I'm going to leave it there though because it doesn't appear in the movie and I have a lot of other things to cover. There's also the Hara Tower, this strange building which doesn't seem to have any basis in any buildings in Dubai. It does remind me a bit of the Dubai frame though, a building which happens to be the world's largest picture frame and is positioned in such a way that landmarks of modern Dubai can be seen on one side while from the other side you can see older more traditional parts of the city skyline. Inside the Dahara Tower we also get a view of a painting which seems to show a building which looks like one of the Emirates towers. Before the Burj Khalifa was built, these two towers were the defining buildings of the Dubai skyline, for a while being the tallest buildings in the city, though now they're only the 11th most tall. Built over a period of three years from 1996 to 1999, the slightly taller one is the Emirates Office Tower, a 56 floor 354 meter tall office building, while its slightly smaller twin is a 52 floored hotel, the Emirates Tower Hotel, coming in at 309 meters. A couple minutes later on in the movie, we can also see another building which seems to have been inspired by the shape of the Emirates Towers. Now there's the matter of the rock inside this place. It's where earlier on in the film that Reis, the great grandfather of Baraz and Mire, created the prison bottle with the splash, flame and earth plates. It's never specified where he got them from, but as the people of Arche Valley seem to have some kind of special relationship with Arceus, perhaps Reis had a relationship with Arceus, kind of like a prophet of some sort. Anyways, Dahara Tower was likely built around the rocks to protect the sacred site. The Dahara Tower is clearly a religious site itself, but we have yet to find out how it properly connects to the rest of the Pokemon mythology. Though I have a couple ideas that I'm going to save for another video. But it being a type of religious site leads me to what I think is the pseudo inspiration for this building, the Dome of the Rock. While it's not located in the UAE, it is found within the Middle East in Jerusalem or Al-Quds as it's called in Arabic. It was built over the foundation stone, the place where God created the world and the first human, Adam. It's also believed to be the site where Abraham attempted to sacrifice his son and as the place where God's divine presence is manifested more than in any other place towards which Jews turn during prayer. The site's great significance for Muslims derives from traditions connecting it to the creation of the world and the belief that the Prophet Muhammad's, peace be upon him, night journey to heaven started from the rock at the center of the structure. I'm not going to get into it any further though because this building and the place that it is located is shrouded in geopolitical and religious controversy as it happens to be built on the Temple Mount where the second temple of Jerusalem was once built and the more I talk about this the more likely that it is that someone's going to accuse me of taking sides so swiftly moving on. On, let's talk a little about the characters in the movie, the people of Arche Valley specifically. 
In terms of the clothing they wear, there's not much to talk about because it's pretty generic movie Arabian clothing which isn't really comparable to what actual Emiratis wear. However, we do see a lot of the men in Arke Valley wearing headscarves, known in the UAE as kofia. There's a lot of different colours around the Arab world, but in the UAE only two types are really worn, checkered red and pure white. The red checkered ones are called shemach, or also kofia, while the white ones are called rotra. I'm just going to refer to both of these styles as kofia as that what I'm used to calling them. Kofia have different styles for formal and casual occasions. For casual outfits it is tied around the head just like it is worn in the Hoopa movie. On the other hand, for more formal events it is worn with an agal. It's actually harder to tie it casually than it is to wear it with an agal, which is what I did on the few occasions I wore one. The kafia is worn with the traditional garment known as kandura in the UAE, though the standard fusha Arabic name is thobe, and each country has its own local name. In Oman, for example, it's called adishdasha. Each country also has its own local style as well. In the Emirates, for example, kanduras have no collar, but have a long tassel with matching embroidery on the sleeves. The kofia were an adaptation that helped Arabs survive the hot desert. It protected against the sun and the dust, and when the weather was amicable they would tie it around the head with their face uncovered. But whenever it takes a turn for the worse or they are hit by a sandstorm, they would tie it around the face, covering most of the face except for the eyes. But this isn't really done anymore because not many people still travel in the desert. And also nowadays when the shamal hits people just sit inside with the AC on until everything dies down, a luxury which the Bedouins certainly didn't have before. Though if you go around the UAE, you'll still find plenty of people wearing the kofia in either the casual or more formal way, along with the kandura. Actually, for this segment I tried to find some photos of me when I was younger wearing kofia and kandura, but I couldn't find any, so I'm very sorry. Maybe at some point I'll find them and I'll stick them up on Twitter, I don't know. Arke Valley itself reminds me of a real place in the UAE. In the Emirate of Fujira, nestled in between the Hajar Mountains, sits a little town known as Masafi. This area in the Hajar Mountains actually has quite a few farms and there's even quite a substantial plant market here as well. Arke Valley in the movie mirrors this in how it is quite fertile. Up until very recently, the only way to get through the mountains to the east coast of the UAE was to come through Masafi, and the town is well known in the UAE as it's the place where Masafi bottled water is extracted and bottled. It's also situated in a wadi, just like the town in Arke Valley. That's all I have to say right now about Masafi, but it's a place that I will definitely be coming back to in future videos. Right, let's take a closer look at the people of Arke Valley. People born in the valley have special powers which are said to come from Arceus himself. We also see many Arceus statues dotted around the village, though this is likely a flavour of Shintoist practice that's wiggled its way into the movie. In regards to Arke Valley, a lot of the things I'll be looking at are from the TV special that came before the movie, which I'll be referring to as well because we actually see more of the village in the TV special than in the movie. Anyways, this group clearly has a close relationship with Arceus, which sort of reminds me of Sufism. Known as al tasawuf in Arabic, Sufism is essentially Islamic mysticism. Its practitioners are known as Sufis. Many people, including a lot of Muslims, think that Sufism is a sect of its own, but it isn't. Historically, Sufis have often belonged to different turuq, or orders. Congregations formed around a grand master referred to as a wali, who traces a direct chain of successive teachers back to the Islamic prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Sufis devote themselves to becoming closer to God, and one of the ways this is done is through dhikr. Dhikr means remembrance and is a devotional act in which phrases or prayers are repeated. It is about remembering the will of God. To Sufis, dhikr is seen as a way to gain spiritual enlightenment and achieve union in God. The devotional practices of Sufis vary widely. Dhikr specifically also varies among each order. Some Sufi orders engage in ritualized dhikr ceremonies, or sema. Sema includes various forms of worship such as recitation, singing, the most well-known being the qawwali music of the Indian subcontinent, instrumental music, dance, most famously the Sufi whirling of the Mevlevi order, also known as the whirling dervishes, incense, and meditation to name a few. These are all ways of communicating and becoming closer with Allah. Now we already know that in the Pokemon world, dance Dancing forms a key component of legendary Pokemon worship, but it seems as though part of what forms the bond between the Arche people and Arceus is the lineage, which can likely be traced back from Ris, who may have had some kind of encounter with Arceus or perhaps even further back to another prophet-like figure. We know that the ancestors of the people in the Arche Valley were able to communicate with Arceus and receive power from him. Perhaps they received some kind of revelation through their communication, and the Arche people's goal to become one with nature is similar to the Sufi goal of becoming one with Allah. Though ultimately the two can be considered different as I hardly think that one with God would find its way into a Pokemon movie. Today Sufism is widely practiced but remains controversial
controversial as the practices of Sufis greatly contravene the beliefs of mainstream conservative Islamic thought, such as how music and dance are both haram during dhikr. But it remains an important part of what constitutes Islam, and I imagine that it may have had an influence on the way the Arki people were portrayed. Their special relationship with Arceus is something that really deserves a video by itself. Before we finish, I want to add something more about Hoopa as a character. Hoopa's battle against its unbound form is indicative of a struggle, a personal struggle, in Islam known as Jihad. Now, I know what most people in the West think of when they hear this word, but I ask that for now, just forget everything you think you know about this term. Jihad means striving or struggling, especially with a praiseworthy aim. In an Islamic context, it can refer to pretty much any effort to make your personal and social life confirm with God's guidance, such as struggle against evil inclinations. It is also associated with military conflict, but if you went and asked a random Muslim what they thought it meant, they would probably say a commitment to hard work and achieving one's goals in life, struggling to achieve a noble cause, or promoting peace, harmony, or cooperation and assisting others, or living the principles of Islam. These are the most popular responses given when Muslims across the Arab world were surveyed. When you try to resist that temptation, to exercise self-control and improve yourself, to live on the right path and be a good person, this is all part of jihad, that struggle to do the right thing, even if it is hard or hurts in the short term. When we look at the development of Hoopa throughout the movie, we can see how it has this personal struggle to learn to be compassionate and helpful, to control itself and not give in to the rage of its unbound form. At the beginning, we see how the unbound form is not on the right path, far from Allah. It uses the minaret from a mosque as a weapon. But by the end of the film, Hoopa reconciles with its unbound form and learns that there's more to life. And eventually, it understands why Gris confined it all those years ago, and in the end becomes closer to Arceus, learning to live on the straight path and be a rightful jinni. And in the end, this is what makes it the most like a jinn, the will to choose its own path and become closer to Allah. In fact, you could say that Ash's quest to become a Pokemon master is a personal jihad itself. But for now, that's about all I have to say in this cultural breakdown of Hoopa Clash of Ages. I had a lot to get through, so there's some things that I would have liked to go over more, but alas, I don't have the time to make super long videos. I really appreciate the attention to detail in places that the people behind this movie put in. It's these kind of nuances, cultural nuances if you will, that I love to see in games and other media. In contemporary popular Western media, there isn't a lot of genuine Arabia to be found, and the region is often grossly misrepresented in either culture, religion, or language. So seeing the UAE being used and adapted into the Pokemon setting made me very happy, and more hopeful about the chances of an Arabian Pokemon region in the future. Though, as the area is so vast, I think it would work well as multiple smaller ones. That being said, though I thought the movie did a good job adapting Dubai into Dahara City with everything I've explained, I'm not sure I fully trust Game Freak to do a good job in a game, given recent releases. Regardless, having an Arabian region would give rise to lots of opportunities to add in more interesting lore and mythology to the Pokemon universe. And I'm sure that many Pokemon fans living in Arabia would be delighted to see their home made into a region. I mean, just seeing part of it in a movie made me over the moon. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this episode of Culture Bits. It's been a while since I've made a video about cultural influences in Pokemon, but I hope to make more soon. So subscribe so you don't miss them and other episodes of Culture Bits. And don't forget to check out Loxton's video about the origins of Hoopa's design. But for now, shukran lil mutabi'a, araki fi al-murra al-qadima.